We are outside of Liberia Donceles, a Spanish language secondhand bookstore that has traveled to several cities around the US and is currently in Indianapolis at Listen Here, a project space for the arts organization Big Car. The bookstore was created by Pablo Helguera and it is named after Donceles Street in Mexico City, which is lined with old bookstores. It was in Mexico City where Helguera grew up that he gathered much of the original stock for the store from donations offering his artwork in exchange for books and producing a book plate that tells the previous owner of each volume. Helguera is an artist as well as a museum educator, and those two roles often overlap. His work focuses on history, memory, pedagogy, and sociolinguistics, among other topics. And he explores these ideas through many formats, including installation, lectures, and performances, projects that often fall under the umbrella of socially engaged art. Helguera is also a prolific writer and sometimes cartoonist, addressing many angles of the art world with great insight and humor. While the bookstore is here, it will be the only Spanish language bookstore in the city, much like when it travels to other US cities. Libreria Donceles provides visibility to the Spanish language and also gives us the increasingly rare chance to browse books and subjects in an unhurried and open-ended way. Today, we're gonna to talk with Helguera and we're also gonna think about other ways to give old books new lives. Hello, I am Pablo Helguera. Uh, I'm an artist. I am at Libreria Donceles and this is the art assignment. Libreria Donceles is what you would call a third place. There was a sociologist named Ray Oldenburg who coined this term, third place, meaning that in regular life, you know, we have work, we have home, and then we have a third place, which for many people is maybe the cafe or a pub or a plaza where we find our friends and where we find people who think like us or, or share similar interests. And I wanted this bookstore to be a third place for people who can come and share their interest in literature, their interest in the Spanish language, and, uh, and come together that way. We're kind of almost like an open mic uh, space where anyone in the community can come and propose ideas of things they want to do um, and uh, do a book reading, a performance, a discussion, anything that, that, is, that pertains to the, the larger subject of uh, having a better understanding of, uh, of Latin American uh, and, and Spanish language culture. One of my um, various or routinary visits to a used bookstore, I found this very beautiful book called Rogaland. It was uh, in a language I did not understand. It was in Norwegian, in fact. And they had these amazing photographs of what looked like an archaeological site, you know. And I was so excited, I, I bought the book, and I decided that I did not want to know what it actually said, you know. I decided that I was going to translate the book uh, <laughs> without knowing a word of the language that I was translating. And it kind of became a very entertaining uh, enterprise. Um, you might have had the experience that if you are in a foreign country that where you don't speak the language, you see a word on the street, or on, on a sign, and then you, you try to interpret it based on what you, how it sounds like to you. You know, like uh, how, it's, how it would sound in English, you know? And um, if you do that, you know, the translations can be really funny and very weird and strange, you know? And I thought that would be like an excellent um, way to um, create poetry. So as I was reading it, uh, reading the, the language in, in, in Norwegian, I, uh, I thought that it would be interesting to see how it would sound to me like in English or Spanish, you know? And then I started producing this uh, text uh, that was a, uh, like a poetic interpretation of, of, uh, of those images. And uh, later I realized that it was indeed an Norwegian uh, archaeology book. It was about uh, farm, uh, farming villages in, in Norway in, during the Middle Ages, and uh, it was like a a book that explored the, the archaeology of what's left of those, uh, those locations. But it, it just became kind of a, uh, an instrument uh, or a tool uh, for a, a poetic project. Our assignment of today is titled Combinatory Play. It consists in bringing together uh, two or three collaborators, each of which will pick a play, uh, a book uh, from your collection, can be in any language, uh, they will pick lines from that particular play and then uh, by copying them and pasting them together you will create a, a combined play of all the different plays that everyone has selected 
and then they will perform it together. John, there are so many different ways you can do this assignment, and there's certainly a way you can do it where you bring together texts willy-nilly and create a kind of gibberish that will probably result in some funny moments, but I really think that it would be most interesting to do this in a very conscientious way, where you select passages from each text and carefully combine them to create something that could be truly miraculous and surprising. Yeah, no, I totally agree. You know what it made me think of is that Einstein used to do this kind of combinatory play, although it was a little bit different. Whenever he would like be stuck on a problem, he would leave physics or mathematics behind for a while and go play the violin or go sailing or something. And he would often find that when doing the other kind of play, because he did think of physics as a kind of play, he would get an idea about physics. Oh, I love it. But for the historical precedent, I actually want to go a little bit further back in history. During the late Renaissance, German genius Gottfried Leibniz published his dissertation on the art of combinations, proposing a universal language of human thought that could express mathematical, scientific, and metaphysical concepts by breaking them into component pieces, much in the same way words are made out of letters of the alphabet. Informed by Descartes in working from the Aristotelian theory that all material is formed by combinations of earth, water, air, and fire, Leibniz imagined he could pictographically represent all things and ideas by placing the right selection of those elements in the right order. Basically, imagine if extremely complex ideas could be easily represented across continents and cultures through a language of signs that would unlock a kind of universal truth. While Leibniz's search proved elusive, of course, there is truth to the concept that language can unlock thought just as thought can unlock language, whether it's through calculus, Esperanto, C++, or emoji. Now, Pablo's assignment does not have us seeking any alchemical truths, but it does present creation as a combinatory act, giving us a system through which we can attach ideas from different disciplines and times to create, via a kind of chemistry, a new solution. We're going to do an, uh, an example of how we would do it here. And of course we're going to do it in Spanish because we're in a Spanish bookstore and we're going to grab books from the shelves to do that. Um, however, you can do it in English very easily. You just grab three plays, you know, uh, from any play that, that is famous that you might want to, to kind of uh, or you can do a screenplay as well and, uh, and take that as your um, uh, departure point. Um, and um, I think um, a, like a collective reading, it's really a really fun way to do this, you know, like do it with two or three friends. Uh, you can also do it by writing. You can simply like uh, <clears throat> cut and paste all the different phrases from the place and then create a, a, a collage really of of those phrases and see what comes up. So now we will be reading from three different plays. Uh, one of them is a French play uh, by Molière, the miser. Uh, a Mexican play by Emilio Carballido, Rosalba y los Llaveros, Rosalba and the Keychain. And from a, uh, a theater piece by Marusha Vilalta. Ven aquí, Valerio. Te hemos elegido para que nos digas quién tiene razón, mi hija o yo. Yo mejor me despido. ¿Por qué eres viejo? Eso es algo a lo que no... <laughs> es lo mismo. Nada más seguro. If I tell you, like, I'm going to be just uh, reading from Romeo and Juliet, lines from Romeo and Juliet, and like, you're going to be reading from uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, No Exit play. The two, and then we start reading that, you know, it, it's just completely nonsensical at first, but then it, something really interesting start, it starts happening. You know, so that's really what I think is, and it's also, it's something that we are experiencing with the audience. Like the audience knows what's happening. They, they know that I'm reading from this play and that this other person is reading from this another play. And um, it becomes more of a collective uh, experience more than, than a, a perfect uh, seamless piece that I am creating for uh, an audience. So it's kind of like a, like a nice literary experience uh, for, uh, for an artist or, or people interested in literature to have. And, uh, and, and really it, it helps, um, or I think it's a stimulating uh, experience in, in trying to like, figure out um, how you can combine two dissimilar things into one entity and uh, how some of these things can actually uh, come together in, a, in an interesting way.